Hello there and many thanks for joining us on this edition of the program People, Politics and Power. I am Imonia Marere. Nigeria is beset by a crisis of governance. Underlined by its dysfunctional federal system, weak institutions and problems associated with its electoral processes. This much has been identified by scholars and practitioners alike over the years. The Supreme Court of Nigeria, in a landmark judgment on fiscal autonomy for local governments on Thursday, sought to resolve some of the complications that have attended Nigeria's federalism for so long. Now, just as the Supreme Court was delivering that ruling, a publication on Nigeria's governance crisis was being presented to the public in Lagos in honor of one of Nigeria's foremost political theorists, public servant, civil society activist, and a regular guest on this program, Professor Liasu Adele Jinodu, who turned 80 years recently. We are therefore dedicating this edition of the program to him and for his enormous contributions to scholarship and public discourse. The publication, Nigeria's Governance Crisis, Federalism, Democracy, and Election Complications, delves into the systemic issues that challenge Nigeria's political and governance structures. It provides a critical examination of how federalism, democracy, and electoral issues interact to create a complex governance crisis in Nigeria. It examines the dysfunctional federal system in Nigeria, which has struggled to balance the diverse ethno-regional political interests, leading to calls for restructuring for a more equitable distribution of power and resources. It also addresses Nigeria's 25 years old democratic practice, which has arguably been marred by weak institutions, electoral fraud, and political violence, and how these issues undermine public trust and the consolidation of democracy. It also focuses on the persistent problems in electoral processes, including inefficiencies in administration, manipulations by political elites, and the prevalence of electoral violence, all of which result in electoral complications. These complications and challenges of governance, after over six decades of political independence, will occupy our attention on the program today. Although an arts program is too short to do justice to such critical issues, my guest we try to put all of these issues in proper perspective. So we'll get started very shortly when we get to meet our guest analysts who are already standing by. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. The, dream, the Nigeria we need is the united, indissoluble, and cohesive Nigeria, which guarantees equity, fairness, justice, and prosperity for its citizens. That is our focus on people, politics, and power. It is fresh, insightful, impactful. It's a must watch. People, politics, and power on AIT.
All right, thank you so much for staying with us and the program Once Again is People, Politics and Power. And today we are looking at the crisis of governance in Nigeria. And my guests are right here in the studio and are joining us virtually. First, let's get to meet uh, Professor Sam Egu. Professor Egu is a, a professor of political science with specialty in political economy and development studies at the University of Jos. But he's currently on national service as the uh, resident uh, electoral commissioner in Benue State of North Central Nigeria. Professor Samegu, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Amare. Thank Great you. to have you once again. Uh, and uh, joining thank us you. here in the studio is Professor Istifanus Zabadi. Uh, he teaches international relations at BM University and is the dean School of Postgraduate Studies at the BM University. Thank you so much, Professor Zabadi, for joining us. Thank you very much. Welcome. I'm Director of Research and Innovation, oh. no longer Dean of No longer, you have moved yeah. on from um, being yeah, Dean yeah. to Director of Research yeah. and Innovation. Yeah. All right. We also expect to join us very shortly, Professor Victor Adetula, the Professor of International Relations and Development Studies, also at the University of Jos. He should be joining us very shortly. So let's uh, begin this way, Professor Sam Egu. Uh, just yesterday, the Supreme Court delivered what many have described as a landmark judgment on the physical autonomy for local government administrations. And some are beginning to interpret that to mean that it is part of the process of trying to refigure, reconfigure Nigeria and part of the long process uh, that has been on, or the agitation that has been on for years, for a recalibration of Nigeria. So let, let's begin this way. What do you consider as the major challenges of the crisis of governance in Nigeria? Well, uh, thank you, Amari Ray. You know, when you have a democracy that has survived seven electoral cycles, that you have elections that are improving considerably, particularly as we have experienced since 2011. And when that electoral process continu continuously produces alternation of power at national level and at subnational levels, and when, when public confidence in the electoral process is on the increase. Professor Egu, I do not mean to interrupt your train of thought, but you need to adjust your camera so that we can see you properly. Uh, at the moment, your, your only part of your face is uh, off the camera. So you need to readjust it a little bit. All right, please go ahead. Has this, in, has this improved? Yes, please go ahead. OK. So the point I was making is that we have had a democratic order that has lasted over 20 years. And in that 20 years plus, we have conducted elections that have improved substantially in terms of integrity and have approximated the will of the people. But at the same time that we have experienced progress in the procedural aspect of democracy, we find out that in terms of the maximalist expectations of the people, that democracy could translate into improved livelihoods, into opportunities for people to get employed, in, in terms of opportunities for people to realize the essence of their citizenship. We do realize that there's a wide gap between that expectation and what the people are getting. And what this simply points to is the failure of governance. And when it comes to understanding why governance fails in a country like our own, you look at a number of factors. And I would want to prioritize among these factors the strength of democratic institutions. Now, when you design a presidential democracy like our own, it is on the assumption that you have a strong parliament or a legislature 
that will hold the executive to account. And this is very important because of the tendency for executive power to be overbearing. There's also the expectation that we have a strong civil society and that citizens have voice to demand accountability. So once the democratic institutions are weak in terms of these deficits, we are going to have problems, but more fundamentally, but more fundamentally in our own context. We have operated our democracy without Democrats. In fact, the state itself, the Nigerian state, is very authoritarian in nature. And we have tried to graft democratic politics onto a very authoritarian structure that does not even allow those who hold power to allow citizens to have a say or to yield to the logic of accountability, of vertical and horizontal accountability. And when you have that situation, corruption thrives and nobody accounts for anything. And therefore, in between elections, governance goes into a state of coma and citizens do not benefit anything. So I think we need to address these two issues. One, reinforce our democratic institutions. Build capacity of citizens and civil society to express their voice and demand accountability. But more importantly, let us change, let us force those who govern to understand the logic of public accountability. Because we have seen more of exercise of power than politics. We can't go on like this. So you can't run a democracy without Democrats. And once you continue to do this without yielding to the voice of the people, you can't have governance. All right. Stay with us. Uh, le let me bring in uh, Professor Estefanos uh, Zabadi at this point in time and to ask, uh, to what extent do you think that the political structures in Nigeria have contributed to the governance challenges that Nigeria has had over the years? Well, you, you see, by 1966, when the coup that brought Ironsi to power as head of state and the abolition of those regions, and the adoption of a unitary form of government. Even though that seemed to have been reversed under Gawan somewhat, but the military culture of unified command was what sustained military regimes. And they bequeathed to Nigerians a culture, a structure that is in name federal, but in reality, it's unitary, where others are given from the center and all the others at the subnational levels obey because of the difference in ranks of those who are governors and that the persons who are head of state and the Supreme Council. Now, democracy has come, but even the constitution we have has retained that situation where by the federal government, is still in a position to back others. And you saw that clearly when uh, President Obasanjo was in office. You know, I, for him, I don't think that he, he transcended from what he was as military head of state to now a democratically elected uh, you know, president. So we have had this situation. That is why state governments have to behave in court so that Abuja can be very nice to them, it still happens. And that is a major issue. I know you have mentioned the issue of the, the, the judgment of the Supreme Court. It doesn't satisfy the federal dimension of things, but we can, we can get to that. So structurally, even including the constitution, that's why they're saying this constitution is not federal. It is unitary. So, but, so in practice, this is what has happened. So in other words, you are suggesting that even though we say we are practicing democracy and we have had a democratic run for 25 uninterrupted years, the political structures that are on ground, including the constitution, yeah. do not seem to bear out the, the kind of democracy that we expect to see. That indeed is what I'm saying. If you go back to the, the constitution that ushered in Nigeria 
to independence was negotiated. Now, since then, we haven't had negotiation of the terms of the Federation. And in the kind of, in our political science classes, one was taught that the Federation is between two levels of government, the national and the subnational. Now, the Constitution ought to have respected that. And also in some other climes, like the US where we borrowed this from, even states have their constitutions, they have their coat of arms and, and all that. Now, that is not what you find right now. What you have is that you have a three-tiered system with the local government now being the third tier. So it is, it is, it is sowing confusion and we will not get anywhere because the element of the people sitting down and sorting out what their differences are and commonalities and on the basis of that deciding to give themselves structures and processes, that is something that is still missing in my view. And unless we do that, uh, the, uh, Professor Ego has talked about institutions and so on, because then you build strong institutions on, on, on those bases. That, to me, is largely uh, a challenge for us at the moment. Mm. Professor Ego, let's uh, bring you in now. In your first intervention, you talked about uh, accountability and transparency. And uh, some people have suggested that the lack of accountability and transparency have had uh, a negative impact on the Nigerian governance system. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I think the, uh, I, I'll, I'll take this uh, point on, but I think the point that uh, Professor Zabadi, you know, uh, is making no, it is very important. I wouldn't, for example, argue that the evolution of the Nigerian federal system is the same as that of the U.S. that we have often cited. But I think the fundamental principle of federalism is non-centralization of power. And the whole idea is to say you, do, you actually transfer to power to other levels of government and there is no ambiguity as to who acts on what. And that more often than not, there are those items that automatically go to federal, and then there are those that go to subnational government. Mm -hmm. This has not been the case. But because our federal system was designed on the base of the mutual fears of the ethnic majorities and never factored in the interest of the ethnic minorities, mm -hmm. we have had a lot of problems. And attempts to correct these distortions over years have also created additional problems of creating new states that are not viable and so on and so forth. But that's a different matter altogether. You will know that in our understanding of governance, governance as the World Bank understands it, is simply about the management of the affairs of a community, the management of resources in an open, transparent way in such a way that you bring in all the voices of the people, avert the different interests, and have amicable resolution of this in a manner that is in the interest of everybody. In that sense, we've not had a work, a functional governance regime. And we expected that democracy ought to be a facilitator of good governance. In fact, all the sacrifices and struggles against military rule in order to get into a democracy is precisely because of that assumption. But you cannot run a good governance regime without institutions that are strong. You cannot do so without the mindset of operators of the constitution that you know, understands that this is about the people and it's about carrying everybody along and delivering services in the most effective manner and to take care of all the needs of the you know, divergent population. Once that understanding is not there, and people are in power and they exercise power for its own sake, you know, without understanding that this is a democracy in which the voice of the people matters, in which participation is key, and in which the 
demand of the political community as a whole is more important than the whims and caprices of the individual. There is no way in which you can advance governance. Hmm. Right. So, the, uh, uh, Pro Professor Zabadi, uh, he's just talked about the diverse nature of the Nigerian state. Uh, and uh, when we talk about diversity, most times we, mo we most likely refer to the ethno-religious uh, diversities and the regional diversities of Nigeria. Now, what role does, do these diversities play in the governance crisis in Nigeria? Look, they, they play a big role. I mean, from what Professor Eku was saying, some of the institutions that democracy thrives on, I'll give you one example, the political parties. A political party is a school that trains both those who will run government and also trains their members and the general public on what the constitution of Nigeria is saying, the responsibilities allotted to every level and, and so on. And it makes them aware in such a way that they can make informed choices. Now, if you don't have political parties, but you have clubs or platforms as some people have referred to them, then that function, that key function does not, does not take place. It's, it's, it's avoided. Instead, you have godfathers, you have stakeholders, you have uh, caucuses, and the whole thing becomes a bazaar where there are different levels of kiosks and supermarkets in this transactional political environment. B votes are bought and sold, and what you may call compromises are con concocted, and those, those diversities now begin to play a very big role. If the process by which you have produced a governor is not transparent and we can't do anything about it and the governor does not come from my tribe or my religion, then there's a problem. You have lost me. So that is why I say these factors have played very big roles in the kind of um, uh, situation that we are. But they are also used to exploit the situation. I mean, people have have gone to appeal to tribal, ethnic, religious, regional uh, issues to get themselves into positions of power. And, uh, and that has complicated matters as well. Mm. What, what I'm saying in other words is that we, every party stands for something. It should have a clear ideological position. This is who we are. And these are our goods that we want to sell to, to everybody. And their membership and followership and support among the general populace should be based on those ideas, those issues. Now, when you see that they are talking about this person is not from our region, or power must be in our region, as they say, you are not talking ideology of this in the sense we, we understand it, as, at least as political scientists. You are talking something else. And that something else breeds the totalitarianism that uh, Sam Egu was t talking about. And I had mentioned the military also deliberately because we have learned from there. The military was not a political school for the rest of society. So what we did was to just copy culture that as they played their own game. And this is why the, 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 the phrase militicians was coined when we got into this democracy, where governors are behaving like military uh, governors and so on. And orders are given, everything is centered around the governor or, or, or the president and so on. That's, that's, that's the danger we have, we have faced and we are still facing. So f f for us, it's more like a copy and paste democracy that we, we are operating at the moment because, because closely related to this uh, issue is the whole question of socioeconomic disparities. Yes. in society, yes, and how that has contributed in one way or the other to the governance crisis that we have in Nigeria today. Is there a well, link? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, what the purpose of government, and we have said so in our constitution, is security and welfare. And I think this is universal. 
that welfare encapsulates so many things, social, economic, even the political freedom that we are talking about, are all involved there. So, and democracy is actually a tool for conflict management, conflict resolution, right? And the, 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 the ability to draw out compromises that satisfy most people. So if we do that, we have to follow the, va the values. Democracy has values, has principles. And if we follow them and apply them, it should take us to where we want to go, i.e. have a government. Governance is about delivering service to people where it is expected, where it is needed. Now, the way things are, as, as my colleague said, you don't have transparency in the way things are done. You don't have accountability. So people are either forced to remain silent and therefore revolt in some ways, you know, because we can have elections several times. I mean, Kenya has had elections. They have never had a military government. But see what, what has happened now. So it is that the this, this, this style of governance has not been delivering what people expect. My colleague talks, talked about maximalist exp, uh, expectation. For us, we're even at the level of minimalist expectation. The first is security. We, are not, we have not had security that will allow us even to develop at our personal individual levels, at our family levels, at our community levels, probably since 2010 or 20, 2009, when we had started with this Boko Haram thing. And we are still in it. And it has expanded and, and metastasized into so many other uh, uh, security challenges. Without that, we cannot meaningfully talk about making life uh, commodious, as, uh, uh, as we would say, for the generality of the people. Because you have to be alive to be a good farmer, to be a good worker, to be a good doctor, and so on. That is an existential uh, challenge. And government is yet to give us good service in that area. Hmm. Professor Oigo, let, let me uh, combine two issues here. Uh, talking about the effects of the weak rule of law on the governance crisis in Nigeria, as well as political instability and election violence in Nigeria. These, these are areas that many say uh, have impeded the flow of good governance in Nigeria over the years. Yeah, uh, Amarere, I think you are spot on. I mean, these are key issues that have tied down our progress in terms of uh, governance. Um, and I think the most important, regardless of the system that you're operating, whether it is liberal democracy, whether it is socialism, you need a society that is firmly anchored on the rule of law. And what that means that you need a judiciary that is strong, that is independent, and it is capable of intervening to rein in individuals and institutions that breach the law on a daily basis. And as we witness the progress of our democracy, we notice that one of the pillars of a functional democracy, the judiciary, is weak. And honestly, the, the, the sense that ordinary people have that justice is for sale, you know, you know, it's not good for the future of this country. And that is also tied to the question of electoral violence. Because so long as those who feel cheated in the course of election do not have hope in getting justice when they seek judicial remedy, you are simply investing more and more in electoral violence. So it is therefore important that we pay attention so they need to strengthen mechanisms, you know, for addressing grievances of people on a daily basis. But as I think of this, also, my mind goes to the fact that, yes, uh, G Professor Ginado, who launched the book that 
actually inspired this discussion this afternoon has lamented the fact that if you look at the design of Nigeria, Nigeria is a social democratic state, a social democratic society. That is the intention of the, I mean, of the key governing elites of this country. And that was why, from 1979, we put into the Constitution that very important chapter two, you know, and we have been told that all political parties need to take their cue from chapter two. And that chapter two expressly states the commitment of the Nigerian states to the welfare and to the security of the Nigerian people. And that section talks a lot about the role of the state in controlling the commanding heights of the economy. Amarere, I can tell you that since 1999, all the political parties that have implemented neoliberal agenda, that have done market reform, none of them have even spoken to their own manifesto. So they have beautiful manifesto. Then when they win power, they set the manifesto aside and begin to sell public property and begin to remove subsidies. You know, And they haven't governed at all in the context of what they have promised to do. And therefore, we must give meaning so that chapter two, because it tells us about the role of the state, you know, in bringing everybody to a level that you can say, I can survive, you know. But once we are doing the exact opposite of chapter two, once political parties are not even speaking or doing what they are, man this is party politics. If you win power, we expect you to say, your policies will now be derived from the manifesto of the party. But this is not the case. But I think together, with uh, the absence of rule of law, the fact that those who have money can buy justice and can undermine, you know, the integrity of the judicial process, you know, really means that this society is in danger. And we need an elite that can become sober. Let them be sober. Because the way they are going, they are creating problems, you know, that will put their long-term interest in jeopardy. Does it make a big difference to you, uh, Professor Egu, that... Section 2 of the Constitution, even though it provides all of these assurances that you have talked about, is not justiciable. This is the argument that people, and I think that is a lazy argument that has come particularly from lawyers. You, you see, one thing I have learned is that when you are reading the Constitution, you read the letters of the Constitution, also read the spirit of the Constitution. The spirit of that Constitution says, that government has a major role to play in investing in livelihood of people. Even when it is not justiciable, there is need to work towards a conscious realization of that objective. You may not be able to enforce it in a law court, but government must be committed to progressive realization. Remember, that chapter two, we copied it directly from the Indian constitution, and the Indians have a way of progressive realization. It is not where you go to court, you know, to seek judicial remedy for the breach, you know, that is a hallmark of that provision. And I think government must consciously work because it's a national objective that we all set up for ourselves. All right, Professor Zabadi, let, let, let me uh, uh, refer you back to yesterday's uh, judgment by the Supreme Court, which, as it were, has now given fiscal autonomy to local governments. Uh, various interpretations have been read into it to say, look, uh, maybe this is the route to restructuring uh, and to true federalism, uh, as it were. Now, how do you think that this judgment is likely to affect the governance system in Nigeria moving forward? Well, I personally don't think that it moves us forward to true federalism as people as saying whatever that means. Because a true federation is the one we have accepted, works for us. But like I said earlier, if federalism is an arrangement between two levels of government, it does not mean you cannot have local government. And we have a history where the center did not determine the number of local governments and their locations. During the first republic, Local government was the business of regions, regional governments. And so we have 
a reference in history. What has happened is that the constitutions we have operated since the 1963 constitution have all been done by the military. And that is why in the current constitution, you find the number of, lo the, every local government is mentioned by name. Now, you see, it does not mean that local governments do not and should not have financial autonomy. I, again, Amlegu was talking about this elite, the need for elite to be sober. If the elite are sober, in the arrangement we had known before, native authorities got their resources and were able to build schools and provide health services and so on. They even ran prisons at some point. Now, how did they do that? They had funds flowing to them. They also were able to generate funds on their own to run their, their, their own affairs. What we have seen is that local governments exist in name. Yes, they have boundaries and so on, but governance took over. That's why the question of rule of law also comes in. I mean, governors have been allowed, they have not been challenged to deliver according to what the constitution requires them to do. So they, 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 they create, uh, uh, what, what do they call this, um, caretaker you know, uh, councils and- And in some places, and, and uh, solar administrators. Yes, and they just, they just use the resources of the local government as they, as they deem fit. That keeps local government away from, 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 from doing what, it's, what it is designed to do. Now, if I mention also that under the military, particularly under the Babangida government, you, remember, you recall that primary education is supposed to be the responsibility of, of the local government. The Babangida administration took that. There was a primary schools board or commission that was based in Kaduna, the headquarters in Kaduna. I think today we have UBEC now. And it's all federal. Then you have for secondary schools, then you have for the other levels of tertiary levels of education. Now, earlier on, my colleague was talking about a federal constitution having powers that are exclusive to federal government. Then um, the concurrent list where both state and federal government can you know, act upon. Then there's the residual list where it's purely for, for the state. That was, was distorted or thrown up, or overboard by the military and we inherited it. So today, we have a situation where local governments will be beholden, I think, more to Abuja than to their, their state uh, uh, governments. Meanwhile, the, the state assembly makes laws that also control local governments. And so you have a constitutional issue somewhere there where I'm not saying that sending money to local governments you know, is all that it requires. But according to rule of law, you must do it also. The processes must also be according to the laws you have that govern your actions. So what I, what I see in, in the future is the likelihood that the federal government can also uh, now use that to create problems for the state. That's, that's I mean, in terms of in, even politics. But we ought to have a situation where there will be varieties of governments according to the parties that we have because candidates and parties have sold their manifestos and attracted the people. That, I'm afraid, may not play out the way, uh, the way we expect. We can celebrate this uh, autonomy thing. I mean, for, since, since 1999, we have been crying that judiciary should also be self-accounting. The legislature should be, it has taken time for that to even happen. So this, these are the issues. We are, we are in a country where the executive is overdeveloped and the parliament is really struggling. You recall that once the military took over, the first thing they did was to get rid of parliament and they weakened the judiciary such that justice will be according to their say-so. That's the culture we have had for the many years of military 
uh, regime. And I dare say, we have not changed. And so we, we, even the generations that are now running, running shows, all they knew in their, their working life is military. So we have imbibed values that are very undemocratic. And those values need to be flushed out. And this is where political education is absolutely necessary. And that is not happening. So Professor Ego, how do we bring democracy back to the grassroots in Nigeria? Yeah, 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 thank you. Now, that's where I want to comment on the Supreme Court judgment and the, and the consequential implication of that judgment. Now, I take you back to the 1976 local government reform. If you read the reform documents, the government of Obasanjo and Yaradwa articulated a clear vision for local governments in this country. And they identified three important things. One, that local government should, come, should become a true tier of government. That's the vision and therefore should be given clear responsibilities. Secondly, that it should become a school for learning the rudiments of democracy. And therefore, holding elections that are credible at local government level is very, very important to re-democratizing this country at the grassroots level. And the third vision of that, in that document was that local government should be an actor in the process of economic development. Now, if you go back to this reform document, the ideas were brilliant. So you need to go back to see how you can really, you know, uh, re-energize democracy at that level. The problem with the power of the governors and the fact that they took over local government revenues in the last 25 years is that they have also eroded the culture of election at the local level. I understand that state independent electoral commission cannot do otherwise because more often than not, governors appoint the members. Many of them are card carrying members of the party in power. And the CX, as we call them, have not been subjected to the same pressure for accountability like INEC has been subjected to at the national level. So if today local governments are to get their money directly, we must also think through how we can ensure that real elections, competitive election that gives all the parties that contest the chance of winning happen at local level. If you stop at the level of directly transferring revenues to them, without thinking through how you can have healthy democratic electoral competition at that level, you know, then we are not serious. It means then that in one way or the other, governors will still bring their, their I mean, those who are loyal to them, or you know, those who are beholden to them, to control. And that money you are giving them today will return to governors in some other ways. That is what I think. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, but, but before I let you go, very quickly, let me uh, pick your, your mind on what you think, uh, or how, how valuable you think Professor uh, Liasu Adele Ginodu's uh, contributions have been to Nigeria's political uh, thought process and to Africa's political uh, thoughts. Yeah, thank you, uh, Amarere. This is very important. I am a professor of political science, but Ginadu belongs to the first generation of Nigerian political scientists that we have. Uh, people like Billy Dudley probably will be older than him, but today is one of the most active from that generation that we interface with on a daily basis. And Ginadu has grown to be one of the most important cephalogists in Africa today. If you are going to read any important book on elections in, Nigeria, in Africa, including the typologies of election management bodies and how they've worked from one jurisdiction to another, we look up to Ginado. 
But more importantly, Dinadu, I knew him first as a political theorist. You know, uh, the major work he did uh, in terms is something that inspired me at the very beginning. And today, Dinadu offers us the roadmap to understanding most of the conundrum, you know, in terms of explaining why politics does not work in this country. So he's an icon, he's a teacher, and uh, he's a very simple person. Ginado connects to all generations. He's a, an incredibly amazing individual, you know, because it is somebody we don't want to leave his presence. You, you, got, you must learn something from Ginado, from his deep knowledge of political philosophy and the working of democracy in Africa. I mean, this is one person that we should all celebrate, you know. He doesn't have money. He doesn't have fame outside the academia, but we hold him as one of the key pillars of our generation in terms of contribution to knowledge. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ego. Let me come to you, Professor Zabadi. Your thoughts on Professor Ginod. I would have said that my colleague has said it all. Professor Ginadu is an institution as far as uh, those of us in political science are concerned. He, he is our teacher. We read him, even me as undergraduates, and um, he is such a humble person that a graduate assistant in our own structure will feel comfortable near him because he's always in the business of teaching, of giving new ideas, of encouraging uh, colleagues to look at things from other perspectives. The Nigerian Political Science Association, since last year, I, I recall, have been having a series of lectures by Zoom. Professor Ginadu will always join. And Professor Ginadu will always correct, contribute, and enrich those discussions. And like uh, my colleague said, if you, if you get near him, you wonder whether you are age mates, you know, and we know that he is, I mean, the man is 80, but his, his strength is such that uh, he belies that age. Even recently in April, we were together, uh, you know, at a political science uh, association uh, conference. And it's amazing that he was, and is more vibrant even some, than some of those who are, are younger colleagues in the field. He has been in, uh, uh, he has run the African Association of Political Science, APS as we call it. He has been involved also in the International Political Science Association. So he is, he is not local by any means. He is an international figure as far as our discipline is concerned. And he has impacted on many. Uh, and I'm happy that we, we can talk about him on, on this platform, and he's still alive. Even at 80, he's very active. Absolutely. Only a few days ago, he Absolutely. was uh, here yeah. in Abuja yeah. at a, a civil society function, yeah. only for him to appear again in Lagos the very following morning yeah. to be part of the uh, presentation of that book that uh, was made, uh, published yeah. in his honor. Yeah. We want to use the opportunity to congratulate Professor Liasu Adele Ginodu, who turned 80 recently. It's a, a regular feature on this program. Professor Egu, we want to thank you immensely for finding time out of your tight schedule to join us. And we wish you the very best. Unfortunately, Professor Victor uh, Adetula uh, was unable to join us. But of course, we had with us here uh, Professor Stefano Zabadi, uh, who teaches international relations at the Bingham University. Uh, and he is the director of research and documentation. Uh, innovation. Innovation yeah. at the university. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Professor Sam Egu is a professor of political yeah. science with specialty in political economy and development studies at the University of Jos, but is currently on national service as the INEC resident electoral commissioner in Benue State. Thank you for your time. And to our viewers thank out you. there, thank we you. want to thank you for investing your time with us. And uh, we wish you the very best well, until you come your way again with the fresh edition of the program. Bye for now.